It's great to see you, and uh, again, a very warm welcome from me. Today, I want us to look at two passages in the Bible together. The first one is Isaiah 61, uh, verses 1 and 2, which says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And the second passage is Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. It says, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the river Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I want to talk to you tonight about how to live a life of true purpose. In May 1982, a man called John Wimber visited uh, HTB, visited this church, and John Wimber was a, an American pastor, and he'd been invited by Sandy Miller, who was the vicar at that time. And John Wimber would have a huge impact on this church. In fact, he went on to have a huge impact on the church all around this country. And one particular evening uh, in 1982, he was speaking here at HDB. And he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit would come and meet with each person here. And there was a little gathering of people there. And one of the people who was in that gathering was Nicky Gumbel who was there, and the Spirit of God, when he prayed, fell. Some people shook, some people fell to the ground. Such was the power and the presence of God in that place. And that night was, for Nicky, one of the first times that he experienced the Holy Spirit in a very powerful way. And as Nicky was being uh, carried out, actually, of the room at the back, John Wimber saw him, and he said, God is anointing that man for evangelism. About 10 days ago, this building was rammed full of people on the first night of Evening Alpha. It was our, our launch night of the new term. We had about 756 guests coming to Alpha. That's 756 guests coming to Alpha. They were queuing up all around the building. This place was absolutely uh, heaving. It's absolutely amazing. Our morning course, one of the biggest that we've had, it was about 85 people in the morning. And many of you will know Paul Cowley, who runs all of our social transformation work here at HTB uh, with the team. Uh, he so has started our fifth site, um, St. Francis Delgano Way, on the estate up there in North Kensington, and they've started their first Alpha course. Over 2,000 Alpha courses have been registered around the UK this term. And Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, Nikki, and, who's the vicar here of this church, they're starting this term their 85th consecutive Alpha small group. You see, what John Wimber saw that night in 1982, we are still seeing the fulfillment of that word. We are still seeing the fruit and the outworking of the Holy Spirit falling and anointing Nikki for evangelism. You see, but it's not just people like Nikki Gumbel who can receive this anointing. It's for all of us, not just for church leaders. Wherever you find yourself, whatever situation you're in, maybe you're in a different sphere, maybe you're in the media or arts or in healthcare or education or in finance or business or in government. You see, each one of us has been made for a relationship with God. And we only discover our true purpose in life when we start that relationship with Jesus, and he fills us 
with his Holy Spirit. I believe that God tonight wants to anoint each one of us afresh so that we might be filled with his Holy Spirit, so that we might discover again that true purpose that he has for each one of us. Isaiah, in this passage that we heard read, he too was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. He said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. This event 700 years earlier would be a foretelling of what would happen when the Spirit of God fell on Jesus himself at his baptism. And it was also a foretelling of the Spirit of God being poured out on all people on the day of Pentecost. All people means you, it means me. It's for each one of us, even today. And Mark tells us in his gospel that Jesus, when he was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, it said that the heavens tore open and the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. And we read in Luke that Jesus went into the synagogue. He unfurled the scroll and he read those words from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And he said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. You see, to Mark and Luke's Jewish listeners, they would have been reminiscent of the creation story. They would have heard of the spirit of God descending Upon Jesus. That would have reminded of them of Genesis 1, the Spirit of God brooding, hovering, descending over the waters. After the flood, when the dove was sent out and brought back the olive branch, it was a sign, a symbol of new life, a new start. When Jesus read from Isaiah 61, the year of the Lord's favor, they would have been reminded of the year of Jubilee, such a significant year in the Jewish calendar, the 50th year. And in that year, what would happen, the, the, every, every slave would be set free. Every debt would be canceled. It would be a clean slate for everybody. It was a year of God's favor, a year of total blessing, a, tier, a year of liberation, a year of celebration. And just as that jubilee year for the people of Israel initiated a new start, so Jesus was to come and proclaim a new start for every person through his death and his resurrection. Jesus was the long-awaited promised Messiah. And his manifesto was a manifesto of transformation, a manifesto of love. And we are all invited to play our part in his manifesto. And it starts with an encounter with the Holy Spirit. It starts with receiving his spirit inside of us. And that's what we see from these passages First of all, when we encounter the Holy Spirit, it's profoundly personal. We are filled with his love. You see, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. He's not just a force. He's a person. It's something that we can experience personally for each one of us. It says the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he's anointed me. I don't know if you ever think sometimes, you know, it's, it's easier to think that God loves everyone else, but I'm not sure necessarily that he loves me. I mean, he can easily love the person who's sitting next to me, but I'm not sure he loves me. I mean, you don't know my background. You don't know my past. You don't know the mistakes I've made. You don't see the stuff I do when nobody else is watching. You don't know what goes on in those secret places. You don't know my lack of faith. You don't know my doubts and my questions. But I find it so encouraging when I read Mark's gospel, this passage here, before Jesus 
had done a single thing in his public ministry. He hears the words of his heavenly father saying, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. The whole of the Christian gospel can be summed up in those few words. You are my child, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Do you know that truth tonight for yourself? Do you know that you are a child of God? Do you know that you are deeply loved by him? That he is pleased with you? Before you have done anything, it is a complete gift of grace. You know, when you know that, when you really know that, it changes everything. It changes how you see yourself. It changes how you see the world. That was my experience. As a teenager, I encountered the Holy Spirit for the very first time. And, and for me, it was so often during the worship a bit like we, we were doing earlier, through those songs, that was when I sensed the presence of God. It was like I knew this overwhelming sense of love that God had for me. See, I grew up in a, a Christian home, fairly functional home. I knew my parents loved me, but in my view, they had to love me. Do you know what I mean? They, they were my parents. That was my job. That was my job, that was their job. Their job was to love me, that was what they did. But you see, they didn't know everything about me. They didn't know some of the stuff that I got up to. They didn't know the stuff that I was thinking about as a teenager. And mom and dad, if you're watching this tonight, I'm so sorry if this is bursting your bubble, but occasionally I did things that maybe I shouldn't have done, and maybe I thought things I shouldn't have done. But you see, then I came to the conclusion that God does know everything about me. He sees me on my good days, and he sees me on my not-so-good days. He knows exactly what I'm thinking. He knows what I'm going to say before I say it, and yet he still loves me. More than my parents' love, it was something deeper, more profound, more secure. This realization that despite everything that I had done and that I probably will do. He loves me. He died on the cross for me. But I can know him as my heavenly father. You know, that changed everything for me and it kind of, it totally defined my life. From that moment on, it was, I want to live for him. You know, it's changed the direction of who I work for. I work for, I've only ever worked for the church. You know, how I spend my time, how we parent our children, how we spend our money. Everything we do is driven by this acknowledgement that I've encountered his love and his spirit. Recently, we celebrated one of my uh, son's birthdays, and he wanted to go with a group of his friends bowling. And uh, we took him bowling. It was in Brixton. We had a fantastic time. I won. Um, competitive dad. Spot the competitive dad. It's amazing when you go bowling with kids because you can put those barriers up at the side. And uh, it's so forgiving when you play. But it was only afterwards that my son expressed to us that he'd actually been quite anxious, quite nervous about his friends coming over. And he was actually really worried because his friends were going to come over and see his mum and dad together in his house. And he later told me that most of his friends from school don't have a dad. And he was desperate that he didn't want to be the odd one out. You see, we are increasingly living in a fatherless society. The Center for Social Justice predicts that a million children are growing up in the UK and they have no significant contact with their father. We all know the detrimental effects of this. Emotional effects, academic, financial. So often this has had the effect of higher rates of crime amongst young people, or substance abuse. 
And I know that so many of us have been deprived of that kind of love with our earthly father. Maybe you're here tonight and that was your experience. Maybe your father was absent. Maybe his love was in some way conditional. Maybe he seemed disinterested. Maybe he just wasn't around for whatever reason. Maybe he was abusive. But you see, the Bible teaches us and the Holy Spirit reveals to us that our Heavenly Father is not like that. His love is unconditional. It's unrelenting. It's unceasing. His love never ends. It never stops like we were singing earlier. It never runs out. It never runs dry. He's faithful. He's available. He's there for you. And you can know that personally. If you've never encountered the Holy Spirit in that way and have him reveal that kind of relationship to you, you can know that tonight. So that's the first thing. When we encounter the Holy Spirit, it's personal. Secondly, it's purposeful. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me. Why? For what reason? It's for a purpose, to proclaim good news. See, the presence of God is for a purpose. I don't know if you ever feel this, but occasionally we can slip into thinking that maybe the presence of God in some way is primarily for us so that we can have slightly more exciting church meetings together or so that we've got someone who we can pray to on our way to work or school or university. Maybe we can just have slightly more warm, fuzzy feelings when we pray for each other. And none of that stuff is bad. But the primary reason the Holy Spirit is given is for mission. Isaiah says, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives, to bind up the brokenhearted. After Jesus is baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, Mark tells us that at once he is sent. He's sent out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he receives the Holy Spirit and then at once he's, he's sent into the spiritual battle. And it's the same for us. We are in a spiritual battle. Some of you may be here tonight and you are acutely aware that you are in a spiritual battle. Maybe it's an area in your life where you're facing real temptation. Maybe you're facing a battle over your health. Maybe in a relationship, maybe in your work, it is a battle. Maybe in your finances. You know, on a personal level, we face these battles. It's a spiritual battle. But also in our society, when we look at the world, there's so much conflict and struggle and suffering. In our own city, when we see rates of knife crime increasing, gang culture, there's a spiritual battle going on that we have to contend for. I don't know if you follow the BBC News at all on in their website. You know, just story after story, celebrities, ordinary people struggling with addiction, gambling, alcoholism, people who are bound in our personal lives, in society, but also in the church. Certainly in the Church of England, people are predicting all kinds of decline. Young people leaving in their droves. Increased secularization in our society. But you know, in the midst of that bad news, we are called to be good news. We are to be carriers of hope. What does that mean? What does that look like for us on a day-to-day basis. And when people see you coming, do they think, here comes trouble? Or do they think, here comes good news? You know, we all know those people, don't we? We think they are seriously bad news. Bad news at work, bad news on the tube, bad news in my family. I don't really want to get near them. But what about you? Is it here comes trouble or Here comes good news. In the way that we speak, the way that we use our words, do we encourage people? 
Do we build people up with our words? In our day-to-day living, in our attitudes, the way that we are at work, are we trustworthy? Are we loyal? Are we responsible? Do we give our boss a hard time or do we make his job easier? You know, if we take the initiative, that's good news for our boss. If we're gentle, that's good news for our kids. If we're generous, that's good news for the people that you're going to take out after this service for dinner. We can be good news. That's on a personal level. But what about as a community? God has given us a huge vision as a church together. The evangelization of the nation, the revitalization of the church, the transformation of society. We can't do those things on our own, but together we can make a huge difference. One of the ways that we can be good news is through planting new communities of worship and of prayer, planting new churches. I was so excited to hear that last Sunday, two new churches within the HTB network were planted. The first church, St. Mary's Southampton. Many of you will remember uh, John and Hannah Finch, their little boy Eli. They were here for a year on the clergy team. And uh, just a few months ago, they went uh, to plant in St. Mary's in Southampton. And I think we've got a picture of St. Mary's. Uh, It was bombed in the war. And this was the church, it had no roof. But still, the community, the congregation gathered together uh, to worship despite the challenges that they were facing. Last Sunday, that church was reopened. 400 people turned up to relaunch that church. Somebody got healed. Somebody became a Christian on that night. I was in touch with John and Hannah this week, and uh, John told me about a lady called Well, he's given her a different name, Claire. But uh, this was Claire's story. He says, the only time Claire had been to a church service before last week was to attend funerals. But last week, she was dragged along by some family friends to the reopening of St. Mary's. When she arrived, she found a warm welcome and said it was the first time she had heard someone talk about Jesus and tell her that God loves her. At the end of the talk, there was an opportunity to put your hand up to be filled with the Holy Spirit. At this point, Claire's heart was beating, and she knew that something was happening. There was also an opportunity to be prayed for healing. Claire had been off work for a year with back pain, and the medication was giving her sleep paralysis, which means she is locked into a paralyzed body and was having waking nightmares at night. They prayed for her, and in the morning, she called to say that she had had the first full night's sleep in months. You see, that is the amazing power of God. That is good news. The amazing thing about that story is there was a lady who was at that service where there was no roof, and she was there on Sunday at the launch service. She was crying experiencing the fact that good news was once again, hope was once again coming to her city. The second church plant was St. Nicholas in Bristol. Many of you will remember Toby and Jill Flint. Toby was uh, on staff here at HTB and one of the clergy team for about 10 years. And they went with their little boy Barney, took a little team down to Bristol. Again, that church had been closed for 65 years after it was bombed also in the war. And again, last Sunday, about over 400 people uh, came to that gathering. It was absolutely amazing. So amazing that they covered it on the local news. You know, this is getting out into the mainstream. It's amazing what God is doing. We need to wake up and recognize that God is on the move. You will have heard the phrase, you know, an empty church is like the empty palace of a long forgotten king. People walk by and they say that the king is dead. But amazingly, when these churches are reopened, the king is not dead. The king of kings is very much alive and he's at work. And that's what we're about. That's our vision as a church. That's our purpose. That's what God is inviting us to be a part of. 
So when we experience the Holy Spirit, it's personal, it's purposeful, and finally, very briefly, it's powerful. Luke tells us that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, his manifesto wasn't just a matter of words. It was a matter of power. He starts his public ministry, and he didn't just speak, but he healed the sick. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He performed signs and wonders. Jesus has the power to change lives. Do we believe that? Jesus has the power to transform your life so that you might bring transformation to others. It's a manifesto of transformation on every level. Personal, psychological, relational, spiritual, financial. And God has a particular place in his heart for the poor. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. I knew somebody once who was so impacted by that verse, they didn't want to forget it. And he decided that he was going to have it sort of tattooed on his arm. So he had the words, remember the poor, tattooed on his arm. And he was on a flight once. <clears throat> He was eating his uh, meal on the airplane, and he noticed that some people were laughing at him uh, from across the aisle. And he sort of looked up, and as he looked down at his arm, he realized that the angle that they were looking at his tattoo, they didn't necessarily see, remember the poor. What they saw was, remember the poo. <laughs> so just a reminder, just if you're thinking of getting a tattoo, just be careful uh, about what words you get put on your body. But we're to remember the poor. If any of you were at the leadership conference last May, you would have heard Brian Stevenson. I mean, he gave what I think is probably the most amazing talk I've ever heard. But he was challenging us to be proximate to the poor, to go where it feels uncomfortable and difficult and challenging. That's what Jesus did. He went to the poor. He went to the broken he was for the marginalized, the last, the least, the lost. You may be here tonight. You may feel like that yourself. You may feel broken on the inside. You don't look like it. You all look absolutely together, but we all have that stuff inside of us. You may feel on the margins. Maybe you even feel on the margins of this community. Jesus came for you, and he wants to empower you. These verses have inspired countless people, countless organizations throughout history, throughout the generations. In recent history, I think of people like Wilberforce, the impact that he had on bringing an end to slavery. Bernardo, Shaftesbury, organizations like International Justice Mission, Tear Fund. Some of you may have seen a um, television program on Friday night about the work of Christians Against Poverty, CAP. You know, an amazing work they're doing, lifting people out of debt, the burden of poverty. That organization alone has seen over 6,000 people become Christians as a result of their work that they do. One reporter said to the founder of CAP, you know, why, why don't you just drop the religion stuff? Why don't you just help people? Effectively, his response was, well, because they don't just need help, they need hope. They need hope of a future, and that's what we're called to bring. We're called to be carriers of hope. That's why we do what we do as a community. That's why we do the marriage course, the parenting course. We want to restore family relationships. We want to turn the tide on family and marriage breakdown in our society. Caring for ex-offenders, we want to help those who've been in prison. That's why we work with the, the ill. That's why we visit people in hospital. That's why we have the elderly person's concert and tea. We want to help those who are in need. Jesus said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. That's what he is inviting us to be a part of. That's our purpose. That's who he is calling 
us to be as a church. But we can't do it alone. We need his power. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. Wherever you are, whatever it is that you're going to find yourself doing tomorrow morning, whatever your ethnicity, your age, your stage, your background, whatever you feel like you have in terms of gifts or qualifications, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon you because He is anointing you to preach, to proclaim, to be good news to the poor. I started this little talk telling you about Nicky Gumbel receiving the Spirit of God, the impact that it's had on this church. You see, what starts in the Spirit, we don't want to finish in the flesh. We have a responsibility as a church to be filled once again with the Holy Spirit. We don't want to live on the fumes of the stories and the people's lives of years ago. We want this to be a reality for our community today. I really believe that God wants to meet with each one of us personally. He wants to show us what it means to have purpose in our lives. And finally, to be empowered by his spirit so that we might go out, we might live, we might work to have an impact on the people that we come into connection with in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh,